Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first open house for 2023 of the Center of Excellence on Data for Children with Disabilities. My name is Claudia Kappa, and I'm a senior advisor in UNICEF headquarters in New York in the data and analytics section when I've been responsible for data work related to children with disability. I'm also part of the Center of Excellence and it's on behalf of UNICEF and the Center of Excellence, I want to welcome you to the first event of 2023. In today's webinar, we would like to provide an overview of the Center of Excellence, its purpose, uh, its composition, and the main uh, project that we handle in 2021 and 2022. We are then gonna zoom in uh, on a presentation of one of the research papers that has been produced in 2022, uh, which focus on anxiety and depression signs among children, understanding country level variability and determinants. And we are very grateful to have the principal investigator and the supervisor together with us today to present the results of the paper. We are then gonna have about 15 minutes for a Q and A uh, on the paper. Uh, and an overall discussion about the activity of the uh, center. So again, thank you so much for joining us. This is the first of the open houses that we're gonna host throughout 2023 with the specific objective of sharing information about the Center of Excellence and through these exchanger, exchanges, foster a partnership. Let me give you in the next couple of minutes a quick overview of the Center of Excellence. And we want to do so by sharing a short video about the Center. All too often, children with disabilities are left behind. In the absence of relevant data, these children remain invisible. They are forgotten politically, increasingly marginalized, and vulnerable to rights violations. New data collection efforts focusing on children with disabilities have led to a dramatic increase in the volume and quality of data available. But more is needed. That's why UNICEF has launched the Center of Excellence on Data for Children with Disabilities. The Center promotes data collection on critical issues affecting children with disabilities. It encourages data analyses and their use to support advocacy and policy change. The Center's core values are innovation, inclusivity, and partnership. Data have the power to transform lives, and for many children with disabilities, this will be a game changer. So the mission of the center, as was mentioned in this video, is to enhance the ability of stakeholders to make timely and data-driven decisions impacting children with disabilities. We have a specific focus, data on children with disability and their family. And the type of data we are focusing on are mostly impact and program level data. We want to support the development of specific methodologies and approaches to data collection. But through the activity of the centers, we also want to foster data analysis and dissemination of data through the principles of partnership, innovation, and inclusivity. In the last five years, significant progress has been made in terms of increasing the availability and quality of data on children with disabilities. This was due, among other things, to the launch, for instance, of the UNICEF and Washington Group module on child functioning. It has been integrated up to today in more than 50 surveys conducted mostly in low and middle income countries. In addition to household survey, significant progress has been made in fostering the availability and quality of data in administrative systems. And all these initiatives are uh, extremely positive and hold the potential for making a difference in policies and programs. 
but through the center, we want to create an opportunity for bringing the field together. The center was launched by UNICEF and has been advised by a strategic advisory group with funding from NORAD. And we are extremely grateful to all the partners who have decided to join UNICEF in these efforts of promoting coordination of data and statistical work on children with disabilities. We have six main priorities that respond to the current gaps that still persist in terms of data for children with disabilities. We want to foster the availability of inclusive methodologies. As progress has been made, we need to recognize that in many instances, there are still some bottlenecks that affect the quality of data on children with disability and the relevance of such data including due to the use of methodologies that are not fully in approaches to data collection, that are not fully inclusive uh, of children with disabilities and their families. So we want to promote methodological work to foster the development of new data tools that are built on the principle of inclusivity. We want to improve access to data. As more and more data become available, we also want to foster data use, and one of the components for fostering data use has to do with improving access and use of data. We want to support data collection, country-level initiative that promote the same principles uh, of the center to enhance the availability of data at the country level. We want to promote knowledge sharing, and of course, through this different initiative, one of the ultimate goal is to fill in data gaps through relevant analysis, but also knowledge gap. And the paper that uh, was prepared and will be presented today is one of such example of use of data and analysis of data to promote better understanding of issues affecting children with disabilities. And of course, ultimately, we want to promote data use the use of data and the available evidence to support advocacy and policy change. One of the core elements of the center has to do with partnerships. We don't expect to be able to do everything by ourselves. The center has been created with the idea of bringing teams and experts together. The center was launched in November, 2021. So we just completed the first year of the inception of the center, which we tried to build in a way the structure and start some of the project of the centers. But we are now enter year two. And the priority for year two will be to develop partnership with various implementing organizations. The typical organizations we expect to be able to interact include organizations of persons with disability, representative from um, uh, relevant civil society organizations, academics, but also national statistical offices. In other words, all those who work together towards improving the availability and quality of data on children with disabilities. The way in which we plan to engage with partners, of course, uh, varies depending on the nature of the project. But so far, the center has been functioning by launching call for proposals at the individual and at the institutional level. This call for proposal are an opportunity for us to be able to identify uh, individuals and institutions willing to work on one of the priority of the centers together. And through this mechanism that we identified uh, Ariella breverman bronstein who is the researcher who are gonna present the paper today. Specifically, the, part, the Center of Excellence has partnered with two young researchers to foster analysis of data on children with disability. And we launched in 2021-2022 a call for proposal on data analysis. The researchers were chosen based on an internationally competitive uh, recruitment process. Two projects were finally retained from the original set of applications and Ms. Uh, Bronstein is one of such projects. During the next open house of the Center of Excellence, we will also hear about the second project that was selected 
back in 2021, 2022, and was developed throughout the course of 2022. When it comes to institutions, the partnership will be guided by a memorandum of understanding in which the areas of our joint collaboration and interest will be outlined. And we will soon launch in the middle of 2023 an institutional call for proposals. So you are through this webinar and through uh, the mailing list, you will receive information about this call for proposals when this call for proposals are gonna be made available. As I mentioned earlier, the center is guided by a strategic advisory group. It's a small group composed of key advisors that we have mobilized on the basis of their um, expertise and uh, institutional affiliation. Some of them are uh, with us today and I want to acknowledge their contribution uh, and the, the expertise and the passion they share with us as we try to set up the center of excellence during um, the first year of its life. In particular, the Center of Excellence Strategic Advisory Group include Matthias Egelan from the Norwegian Directorate for Education, Department of Welfare and Human Rights. We have Elizabeth Lockwood from CBM, Global Disability Inclusion, who is CBM mm -hmm. representative to the United Nations. We have Jennifer Maddens, who represent the Washington Group, has been the chair of the Washington Group on Disability Statistics. We have Juan Ignacio Perez Bello from the International Disability Alliance Secretariat. Elena Schmidt, Director of Evidence, Research and Innovation at Sightsavers. Then we have Julie Weeks, Chief of Measure Research and Evaluation Branch at the US National Center for Health Statistics. And she's also um, uh, one of the key members of the Washington Group on Disability uh, Statistics. And let's now come to uh, today's presentations. Um, as I mentioned before, today's project has been led by uh, um, Ms. Ariela, Dr. Adieva, uh, Ariela Breverman Breinstein, who is a pediatrician from Mexico City. Ariela holds a master's in public health from Boston University and a PhD in epidemiology. She's currently a doctoral research fellow with the Urban Health Collaborative at Drexel University. And previously, she worked as researcher in the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. Ariela's PhD research focused on the association of urban determinants and different maternal and child outcomes in uh, Latin America. During the course of the work with the Center of Excellence, Ariela was, um, collaborate, was uh, supervised and collaborated with uh, uh, Dr. Tonato Barrientos Gutierrez, who is a medical doctor from the Autonomous Metropolitan University in Mexico and a doctor in epidemiology by the University of Texas at uh, Houston. Uh, Dr. Barriento trained as a, socio, a social epidemiologist at the University of uh, Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he focused um, his studies and his research in the analysis of contextual and structural causes of diseases. Um, Dr. Bar Barriento is currently the director of the Center of Population Health Research at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. So thank you so much. Uh, Ariela and uh, Tonatu, we are very excited to have you um, today to share the results of your work with um, our audience. And without further ado, I'm going to give you the floor so that we can hear about the research findings. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, can you all see my screen? I hope. <laughs> um, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Claudia and the Center for the invitation and the opportunity to present this work. My name is Ariela, and I will be talking about anxiety and depression signs among children and adolescents and trying to understand a little bit the control level variability and determinants. 
Depression and anxiety are major public health issues. Uh, while they often have an early presentation, most of them remain untreated until later in life. And the delay in treatment can have long-term consequences throughout the life course, limiting educational and interpersonal milestones that impact the development of skills needed for a transition into adulthood. Child and adolescent mental health, including anxiety and depression, are often overlooked in global and country-level programming. And they tend to be one of the areas of health that receives the less investment, especially in low and middle income countries. Um, also, the evidence on the proportion of children and adolescents affected by anxiety and depression is scarce uh, globally and with great variability across countries and regions. Some of the potential causes for this variability are the different definitions that are used uh, while some studies report diagnosis, others report signs and symptoms. Also, there is a lack of standardized population data collection methods to get the data from household surveys or, or other national surveys, where sometimes the questions are asked to the primary caretakers, others are directly to a child. So these differences can lead to a variation in the proportion of children that are estimated to have anxiety and depression. Um, also, we have a limited availability to conduct mental health surveillance, especially in low and middle income countries. And there is a stigma and, and the cultural view surrounding anxiety and depression, which might affect the reporting and other contextual factors that also might affect how well measured um, anxiety and depression are across the world. There has been a lot of research looking into risk factors of anxiety and depression in children. Most of the work focuses on individual level factors, such as being exposed to child labor, bullying, physical or, or psychosocial abuse, intimate partner violence, growing up in an unstable household environment, and some more uh, individual level factors. Uh, but there is less evidence on the association with contextual factors. Studies on children and adolescents exposed to war, mass trauma, have found higher prevalence of anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, also children who live in extreme poverty or have suffered population displacements due to national, natural disasters have a higher prevalence of anxiety and depression. However, most of these studies have been conducted from an individual perspective, looking into populations that have been exposed to such, um, <laughs> sorry, to such events. And what we believe is that understanding the underlying factors associated between the country variability and anxiety and depression signs and symptoms in children and adolescents could help us prioritize future research and resource allocation to develop national and international policies aimed at protecting children's mental health in specific contexts. So that's why we did this study. <laughs> and in this study, we aim to examine the between country variability on the percentage of children and adolescents five to 17 years old with anxiety and depression, and to explore the potential association between anxiety and depression signs in children and adolescents aged five to 17 years old and different socioeconomic and stability country level factors. The data we used for the proportion of children with anxiety and depression uh, was extracted from the multi, multiple indicator cluster survey which is a household survey that's implemented by national statistics offices in collaborations with UNICEF. And this survey tries to monitor different indicators on maternal and child health overall. Um, the survey includes the, the Washington Group um, Child Functioning Model, which, specific, which was specifically developed uh, to obtain information on functional difficulties across 14 domains, which include anxiety and depression. And we use two questions to define severe anxiety and severe depression. One, for anxiety, uh, we use the number of children that whose caregiver reported that they seemed nervous, anxious, or worried every day. And for depression, we use children whose primary caretakers said they seemed very sad or depressed every day. Um, we included all children that have anxiety or depression, and we combined them into one uh, sole variable. We also analyzed separately, but the results were very similar. So for now, we're only presenting the results for children with anxiety or depression. Um, 
And then also from the mixed survey, we obtain information on individual demographic characteristics like age, gender, mother's education level, and the household weight index that were used as covariates in our models. Our country level indicators, we separated into stability and socioeconomic. And by stability, we grouped a set of indicators that speak as to the political, economical, and social climate of the country. We mainly used the fragility index by the World Bank, which corresponds to a list where countries in a fragile state have the weakest institutional and policy environments or the presence of a UN peacekeeping operation. Um, it was primarily developed as a tool for the World Bank to adapt approaches and policies and monitoring instruments in different contexts. Um, in our study, we included it as a binary variable with one corresponding to countries listed as fragile and zero to countries not listed as fragile. Um, the second stability indicator we used was the Global Peace Index, which was retrieved from the United Nations Development Program data. And it's a composite index measuring the peacefulness of countries. Uh, made up of 23 quantitative and qualitative indicators. They are weighted on a scale, and the result is an index that goes from one to five, where one is the most peaceful and five is the least peaceful. In our sample, all of the countries included, uh, which are 30 countries, uh, are between two and three. So we named it peaceful and less peaceful. The third variable was the number of refugees per country of asylum, asylum that was also retrieved from the United Nations Development Program, but the data is collected by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And we estimated the proportion of refugees per country of asylum by dividing the number of refugees by the total country of asylum population. And it was included as a continuous variable in our inferential analysis. And lastly, we also included the number of people internally displaced by violent conflict or by natural disasters. We got this data from the Global Internal Displacement Database, which collects data from international and local government sources to track displaced populations. These numbers were also divided by the country total population uh, to obtain the proportion per country and were included as continuous in the inferential analysis. And for socioeconomic indicators, we used uh, indicators that characterize the socioeconomic environment of each country, such as income, education, and life expectancy. They were all obtained from the World Bank data, and we used gross domestic product per capita, life expectancy, uh, the percent of the population 25 and older with primary education completed, and the percent of um, the population 15 years and older who are currently unemployed. Um, we tried to match the indicators to the years of the survey. However, in some cases, the indicator has a lag of two to three years, depending on when the data was available. For the statistical analysis, we estimated the weighted proportion of children 5 to 17 with signs of severe anxiety or depression by country. And then we conducted some descriptive statistics for the individual and country level characteristics. And then to finally to explore the associations between country level indicators and the odds of severe anxiety or depression in children and adolescents, we fitted multi-level logistic regression models for the combination of severe anxiety or depression signs. And we chose multi-level models to account for the clustering effect of individuals within country, but we also adjusted for those individual characteristics that I mentioned, age, uh, sex, mothers, education level, and the world index. Since we were interested in potential association, there was no need to account for the complex survey design in the modeling stage. However, we did account for that when we estimated the proportion of children for each country. Uh, the mean country level percentage of children with anxiety, with severe anxiety and depression signs was 8.2% with the lowest percentages being 0.6 in Vietnam, 1.3 in Belarus, and 1.4 in Lesotho. And the highest was 18% in the Central African Republic, 19% in, in Iraq, and 22.6% in Chad. Uh, we also took a look at the regional coverage of our data uh, using the 2020 
5 to 17 year old population data, the region with the largest coverage was Latin America. We had 34% of the region covered, followed by South Asia with 24.3% and Middle East and North Africa with 22.5%. And the rest of the region had less than 15% coverage. Uh, in this table, we present the, meet the characteristics of our sample uh, by having or not anxiety and depression signs. The mean age was 10 years old. 50% of our sample were male. 48% lived among the poorest household. And more than 50% had a mother with primary education or, or less. Um, this percentage being higher for children who had anxiety and depression. Um, in this table, we present the distribution of the weighted percentage of children with anxiety and depression signs by country level characteristics. Um, all the continuous variables in this case were categorized so that we could see the distribution. And the colors indicate the percentage of children with disability with green, with, sorry, with anxiety and depression signs, with green being the lowest and red being the highest. Um, we can see in this table that Pretty much all stability indicators had um, significant differences. And in countries that are more unstable, we had higher. It's like they, they have countries in fragile state, countries that are less peaceful, that have a higher percent of refugees or a higher percent of population displacement have higher uh, percentage of children with anxiety and depression signs. With regards to the socioeconomic indicators, we can see that there are no major differences regarding life expectancy. And then for the primary completed, the countries that have the lowest percentage of people with primary completed have the highest um, percentage of children with anxiety and depression. And then for the population age 15, uh, for the population unemployed, we see a similar trend where the highest unemployment has the highest uh, prevalence, uh, the highest percentage of children with anxiety and depression, and then the same for GDP. Um, and finally, these are the results of our multi-level models where we can see the odds of severe anxiety of depression signs by country level indicators. And we can see that we had significant associations for most of the stability indicators with countries in a fragile state having one point time the odds of severe anxiety and depression compared to countries to children that are living in countries in a non-fragile state. Uh, children living in countries with a global peace index of with a less peaceful global peace index had 2.5 the odds of severe anxiety or depression signs compared to children living in countries that are uh, peaceful. Children living in countries with higher percentages of refugees and high, uh, had um, 1.8, uh, sorry. <laughs> Children living in countries with a higher proportion of population displacement by conflict had 6% higher odds of presenting severe anxiety and depression. And also children that are living in, a, in countries with a higher percentage of refugees had higher odds of having severe signs of anxiety and depression. For the socioeconomic indi uh, indicators, there are pretty much no associations. We can see that the, all the odds ratios are real close to one and none of the confidence intervals are significant. So this basically tells us that stability is important and can be an important contributor to the development of children. And it's something that we should keep in mind. There are some strengths and limitations that we must acknowledge. First, we conducted a multi-country analysis that included 30 low and middle income countries. And we used multi-level models that allow us to adjust for individual household characteristics, making our results more robust. And our intention was merely to explore these potential associations. Um, however, we know that there must be further studies to assess the true impact that they may have. And regarding the limitations, the most important ones are that we're using survey data for our outcome that has its own limitations, mainly because it's the self-report of caregivers regarding the children's signs. And it does not provide a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. It's just a science that the caregiver reports. Uh, additionally, we found limited data on country level indicators, which reduced the number of countries that we could include in our sample and also the number of 
indicators that we could explore in this study. And in addition, some of the indicators we included might be underreported. For example, population displacement data, despite the efforts from the global internal displacement database to obtain the most accurate information, this variable is sometimes hard to capture and underreporting is very common, which might be biasing our results. Despite all these <laughs> limitations and strengths, we do believe that our study highlights the need to recognize mental health determinants that might be present at a national level and the large variability in the percentage of severe anxiety or depression signs in children aged 5 to 17 suggests that living in conditions uh, that living conditions at a national level are relevant for mental health in children, especially conditions related to peace and stability. Uh, while national factors are not easy to change through interventions, uh, international discussions need to take place to understand that conflict and stability not only have direct effects, but that they also affect the well-being of children and adolescents in the long, in the long term. Uh, under the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health Framework, Global efforts to improve the conditions for children with psychosocial disabilities and functional difficulties need to acknowledge these and provide recommendations to promote peace and protection of human rights and well-being among nations, especially for the children. And well, thank you all for your attention. I think this is my last slide, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Ariella, for a very comprehensive uh, uh, overview of the project that you worked on. Um, very interesting results. Now we'll turn our attention and uh, Toma will provide some discussion points. Toma, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to start by congratulating Dr. Raberman um, for her uh, research paper. Uh, I think that sometimes we forget about the relevance and the importance of country level um, determinants uh, and how is that these uh, macro level conditions are having an impact on, on child's well-being and, and development. And um, I, I, I think that the methods that she used, you know, to explore these country level determinants while adjusting for individual level characteristics are extremely relevant for this type of, of work. And, and I think that we should be using those uh, more frequently trying to explore um, these, these um, structural conditions that are affecting um, children. Um, I really like you know, the, this, this idea of combining um, and these variables that indicate um, you know, the possibility of conflict and fragility and displacement in countries while at the same time adjusting for socioeconomic conditions. I, I was not surprised to see that socioeconomic conditions um, are extremely relevant for, for uh, child's development, particularly for, for uh, depression and anxiety signs. But um, I think that the part that was most interesting to me was particularly um, the analysis of stability indicators because that is something that I have not seen um, as often. So so I will focus my comments uh, on those. And perhaps the first thing is is to to realize um, as Dr. Braberman was showing in her slides, um, the very large heterogeneity of anxiety and depression signs across countries, right? Because that that is that is very striking. Um, how do we explain that that there's such large variability across countries uh, beyond the things that can be explained by the individual level uh, conditions, so much which, of which were, were adjusted uh, in, in the model? And I think that that heterogeneity is something that should uh, really uh, capture our interest, because basically, for me, what it means is that there are a lot of country level determinants that that should be explaining why countries are experiencing such a different uh, level of, of anxiety and depression um, signs. And, and perhaps one of the things that Dr. Raberman mentioned was, was the issue of the convergence of human rights and, and well-being. And I think that we have not spoken enough about 
the extreme relevance of, of human rights for well-being and particularly for children's well-being. Um, so I think this analysis, I mean, even under its limitations, are providing a very clear picture of how is it that, you know, aspects like um, the internal and external conflict that can be experienced by, by countries or the possibility of being subject to a natural disaster and, and, and experiencing population displacement um, can affect not only a country in a very acute and very immediate way, but also, you know, to reverberate and to create these very long-term conditions that are going to be affecting the um, child's um, child's well-being and, and development. So, um, so I think that, that we really need to start looking into um, human rights, uh, the human rights framework more carefully. And, and of course, to participate more from the academic perspective in generating evidence of how is it that um, moving away from, from human rights creates all these uh, conditions. And particularly one of, of those that I would like to discuss, because I, I again feel that we do not talk enough about it, is peace. And I think that we, we need to, to be very aware of the relevance of peace as a major determinant of health and, and well and well-being, particularly um, in children. And of course, there are international efforts that are that have been dedicated to maintain and sustain um, uh, peace and, and, and human rights in general through international organizations uh, such as UNICEF. And they have been extremely advocate about the, the impact that conflict and war is creating uh, on children. But again, I think that that we also as academics, you know, and, and as people who are creating evidence, we need to be uh, much more um, adamant about uh, analyzing the, the impact that conflict and war is having on, on well-being. Um, and then I think another aspect that is also extremely relevant and that we should pay more attention to is the possibility of natural disasters uh, creating unstable conditions for, for child's development and, and well-being. Um, I think this analysis showed to us, you know, that displacement due to natural disasters is creating uh, this instability that is affecting our children. And of course, we need to start looking more into that because uh, in this analysis, we only had this variable about the percentage, the percentage of people who was displaced. Um, but, but of course, climate change and natural disasters are going to have a uh, much broader impact, and, and they are also going to have other mechanisms through which they will affect um, a child's well-being and functioning. So I think that we need to be much more active in terms of analyzing uh, how climate change is going to affect a child's functioning, not only on, on anxiety and depression, but also in all the other um, uh, domains. And, and of course, it, I think that it is not only a matter of of analyzing associations, but also that we need to move forward into finding long and short-term um, solutions to ameliorate the impact of climate change in, in children. And, and of course, I think one of the, the things that was very evident uh, when, when Ariela showed us uh, the, the proportion of children who are experiencing anxiety and depression signs is that low and middle income countries are particularly subject to these type of conditions. And if you look around, uh, for instance, if you look at Latin America, you will find that um, population displacement due to war and conflict is something that we live every day, almost across all countries, uh, but particularly in countries like Mexico, where population displacement due to internal conflict is something that is happening um, very, very frequently. Uh, and now we are also experiencing, you know, more frequently uh, displacement due to natural uh, disasters. So, I I think that this type of analysis is extremely relevant in, in, in showing how countries are experiencing this impact, uh, impact in, a, in a differential uh, manner. So I would like to close by congratulating all the countries who participated in efforts by, by UNICEF. Um, I do think that we need to increase uh, data availability, particularly for countries who are experiencing uh, conflict and disasters. And I know that this is extremely complicated and, and I think that this, this is going to deserve a discussion on itself, 
because I'm, I'm sure that some of the lessons that have been learned in the process are going to be extremely valuable for countries that do not have this information and that are looking in ways on how, how to get them. And so it is, not, it is not an easy task. And I at some point and talk about ways in which we can expand the use of, of, of uh, these instruments to other countries and particularly countries that are in, in a fragile uh, state. So I would like to close by, by um, thanking Dr. Raberman for her presentation. And, and of course, I'm, I'm hoping that she will continue with this line of thought and, and research, which I believe is, is really, really important. Thank you very, very much, Arcana. Thank you, Dr. Berrientos, and thank you, Ariella. Maybe if you could keep both your um, videos on, we'll, we'll go into the Q&A section. Thank you for your thoughtful comments uh, that, that can then propel us into the Q&A. I see we already have some questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So perhaps we could start um, with the first one that somebody was asking for uh, this presentation, and can you send the link to the report? or perhaps a presentation. We will be sending a uh, link to this recorded uh, webinar. So everybody will definitely get that. And of course, this paper will be published. We're uh, expecting it to be published in May within our series of uh, the collection of working papers. And that will be out in May and it could be, um, and will be available on, our, uh, on the Center of Excellence website. So I wanted to remind everybody of that. Um, I'm going to just put one of the questions into the chat because I'm not sure everyone is seeing our Q&A. So perhaps, um, Ariella, you could take a look at that question. It's from Ian Atfield. Methodo methodologically, any ideas how to distinguish between longer-term anxiety, depression, and symptoms that one would expect to happen at times of acute crisis? I was struck by Nepal's relatively high rate 11%, despite little recent conflict, and it's linked to natural disasters that are common. I wonder if you could reflect on that. Over to you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ian, for that question. <laughs> it's a really good question. And well, I think it's important to mention that this study is cross-sectional, and we only have one time point for the data, and we only have one survey that we're using for the data. So I think that to distinguish between longer term and shorter term, term uh, effects of anxiety and depression symptoms, we need more longitudinal data. And that also adds to the call for uh, increasing data availability on, on these issues in, uh, in all countries. Um, without that, I think it's, it's a little bit hard for us to know if it was a long, like a long lag period or a short. Um, and I think that's mainly what I think. Uh, but I can, yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that's what I, I think we need more longitudinal data so that we can explore different association and uh, over time and trends over time. Thank you, Ariella. Um, we have another question. Uh, so this is more uh, going beyond your particular one, but perhaps you can, um, can comment on it, and I just put it in the in the chat so everybody can see. Uh, this is from Ibrahim Buru from Somalia, and here are some questions that he is asking. Um, one is, do we have a comprehensive questionnaire screening the severity of depression and anxiety in children? How best can we assess this? And what screening tools can we use to screen for anxiety? So I think it's around that. Uh, so any thoughts on that? Uh, well, the, the questionnaire we used is the, it are the questions that are included in the child functioning model at, in the mix survey. It's not a questionnaire designed to diagnose anxiety or, de or depression in children. It's mainly just to get a sense of the signs, if they are present or not in the household. It's what the caregiver reports as to a comprehensive questionnaire for screening. Uh, that's all out of my <laughs> league. I don't really know if there is one or not. Uh, it could be useful, definitely, if if there is one. But I just wanted to clarify that in this case, we're not talking about diagnosis, and we just based our outcome in the child functioning model. Um, 
Thank you, Ariella. Um, I think we have one more question here. I'm just looking through them all now. Uh, so somebody's asking for the link of the short video. I will get that and put it in the chat. Um, I think that's the one that Claudia had shown at the very beginning of the presentation. So we'll get that for you. And I'm just looking down. Okay, here's one from Emily. Let me just put that in the chat. Uh, sorry. And she is asking, did you attempt to distinguish between cyclical and non-cyclical disasters? And if so, did you attempt to address levels of resilience? Uh, no, in this case, we didn't distinguish between cyclical and non-cyclical. As I mentioned, we're talking about a cross-sectional study. I know that there are places that have disasters that keep happening in a more cyclical way, but that's not what we explored in this case. It's definitely something that should be explored. Uh, it's definitely something that we need to take a more careful look at and pointing by the results that we found, like that was the idea of the, this paper. We found these certain associations and we explored and the idea is to gen like we wanted to generate these kinds of questions to guide some future research into this area. So yeah, we didn't, but it's definitely something that should be looked at. Thank you, Ariella. And I'm just putting one more. As somebody's asking, um, addressing children with disability as standalone target is important, but consider them in the inclusive schools and society uh, is vital for all. Collecting data for all will give more li more live and transforming information. What do you think? Um, oof. <laughs> Uh, I think it's definitely important to get data from all, but it's also very true that children with disability tend to be marginalized from the society and schools, and we often and often overlooked, and data on them is not sufficiently collected. So I think these efforts to specifically focus in that group is the idea that we need more data on these types of children that are often marginalized from society. Thank you. Okay, um, question about addressing children with disability. Oh, sorry, I just put the same one in. Uh, there's another one from Sandra. Let me just get that. So Sandra is asking, um, uh, thank you, first of all, for this critical analysis. My question is whether the data was disaggregated by disability. Um, well, I don't really know what she meant by that. We did not disaggregate by disability. We only looked at, like we, the surveys, the response was the children that had anxiety or depression and then children that didn't have anxiety or depression. The children that didn't have might have had other disabilities that were not anxiety or depression, but they wouldn't have been classified as having anxiety or depression. I don't know if that answers the question. If you could clarify, perhaps uh, participant, and if, you, if that did not answer the question, thanks for thanks for that, Ariella. Uh, so here's another question from Claire. It's around how we ask parents and caregivers about childhood depression and anxiety. Are we asking those questions, taking into account children may develop physical signs or physiological um, uh, changes? So in some cultures, uh, for instance, there is poor understanding of anxiety and depression, and this relies on the parents recognizing the signs. What screening tools and how did you go about that? Uh, so the, the answer is the questions that we use for the ones included in the child functioning model, and they basically ask for anxiety if the child seemed nervous or anxious during the last week, and if it was weekly, daily, uh, like on a frequency scale. And we we took daily as the cutoff for severe signs of anxiety and depression. And then for depression, it was mainly if the child seemed very sad or depressed. We the, Those questions did not address these physical signs. Um, but I don't know, maybe they could be improved. I am not part of the Washington group and I didn't develop the, the, the child clustering the child functioning model, it's out of my area of expertise. So I I will refrain from making any more comments at this point. Yes, thank you, Ariella. Um, 
So uh, I think we have a couple of other questions, but yes, the Washington Group questionnaire has been reviewed and trusted and everything. So uh, it's gone through a rigorous process of, uh, of testing to make sure that uh, accurate information is, is provided as accurate as possible. Um, I don't know if there's anybody here, if Julie or anybody from the Washington group would like to comment on that, please uh, feel free to open your, your, um, your video. I see Julie and Jennifer are here, but I won't put you on the spot. If you're willing to, please do comment on that. Okay, we can go on to the next question. Uh, here's a question. Thank you for this valuable research and analysis. Are you considering any research on access to community-based and professional workforce to address mental health needs of research and families? So I don't know if you specifically, if this is a question for you specifically, Ariella, but are you doing anything about that? But perhaps this is a question for the Center of Excellence as well. Uh, over to you, Ariella. Uh, for me, I, at this moment, I'm not <laughs> doing anything about that, but it definitely would be interesting. Um, I think it's something that should be explored and it's also something that could shed more light into this whole contextual factors, country level determinants that could affect um, mental health in children. Thank you, Ariella. Um, here's one question. Uh, I'll put this in the chat because I don't think everybody can see it. Uh, I would love to know how important the factor of negative emotions experienced by children with disabilities to be considered incorporated into the methodology and tools for this analysis. Um, uh, well, I guess negative emotions experienced by the children are important and ideally we should incorporate them Unfortunately, we only, we only use the data from the mixed service and the child functioning novel that has been validated and thoroughly explored for um, to assess, well, to get like a screenshot of what are the children that have anxiety and depression signs. We, at this point and at this moment, we cannot incorporate anything else, anything more, but it could certainly be considered for future research. I think it's a very broad question and an important one, uh, but probably a bit, a bit beyond um, uh, what is being um, dealt with in yours, yeah, in your analysis. Um, somebody's asking for a bit of clarification. Children with disabilities are at more risk of developing mental health conditions, particularly mental health disorders was the survey disaggregated by disability? So I think you touched on this before, but perhaps you'd like to um, restate. Uh, yes, the survey was not disaggregated by disability. We included all the children that had available information on the child functioning model, whether or not they were classified as having a functional disability or not. Okay, um, I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, I'm not sure I understand, but perhaps Ariel, you will. Did you find any area of improvement of the child functioning module while doing the analysis? Did you find any improvement, any area of improvement? I don't. So perhaps, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I mean, I I think I've worked with the child function model before for the assessment of disability in or functional difficulty in general, and I think it's a great tool. It's a good screening tool. Um, and I, I mean, I know that it's been thoroughly tested and validated. So at this point, I cannot say that I found any area of improvement. There's always room for improvement and maybe some questions could be changed, but I, I can't comment on any particular issues at the moment. Thank you, Ariella. I think we're coming to a close. I hope we got most of the questions. Um, uh, again, I'll see if, uh, if anybody from the Washington group would like to comment uh, on the modules that were used for this particular analysis, I'll just uh, wait a minute, see if anybody is available. No, all right. But thank you so much, um, 
Ariella, mm -hmm. Dr. Barrientos, uh, for both of you for coming for our first uh, open house for the Center of Excellence for Children with Disabilities. And uh, thank you participants for your um, participation, active participation in this. I would like to remind you that Ariella's paper will be published in our collection of working papers and it will be released in May. And uh, the second project will also be presented in a future webinar. And it's about um, do parenting practices differ among children with disabilities and without? So that's up and coming. I'd like to thank uh, Ariella and uh, Dr. Barrientos again, and especially our uh, international sign interpreter. <clears throat> Great work. And uh, I think we will close it off. And uh, thank you all very much for attending. Have a wonderful day.